everybody. Happy weekend. Happy Sunday. It is Sunday. Is it? So yeah. it's, it's actually Friday today we're recording it and it's weird. What? The show's not live? It's not live. It's as live. Yeah. We've got the dogs with us today. We do. We thought oh, we'd in, Meg. introduce you to Buddy and Meg. They're always kind of pattering at our feet when we do the show because they love cuddles and we thought this time we might as well bring them on board. Bring them in, get some value out of them. They can start giving us some return on investment. Please. Stop biting me. Oh, bless him. What do we have on the show today? We've got loads of interesting stuff, as usual. We don't have Bob's Bee Cave this week because he's very busily putting together a very exciting edit that we're going to be announcing soon. So watch this space, but he will be back soon and he's coming back with something very exciting. We have the competition winner and we have another competition. Everybody loves a competition and we've always got great prizes, so make sure you stay, hang around and see who's won and see what you can win. We have a great interview on the show today. Very excited that this fabulous person said yes. Um, Mark Miller, very, very cool. We were very lucky to meet him when we did Life After Flash uh, to head up and film him up in Scotland. Um, we also had a lovely breakfast with him and Sam and Melody and everybody, didn't we? It was really nice to get to know him. Incredibly talented person. To lead into the interview, I thought it'd be fun to do five fun facts about Mark Miller. Yes, I pulled them off the internet, so no, they might not all be correct, but Mark, if you're watching, let me know <laughs> if the internet is not telling the truth. And we'll try and resolve it somehow. So, five fun facts of Mark Miller. Fact one. The Ultimates, written at Marvel, was selected by Time magazine as comic book of the decade. Many stories that he wrote have inspired big screen blockbusters, including Wolverine Old Man Logan, which of course inspired Logan, as well as Civil War, where the crossover storyline was the inspiration for Captain America Civil War. Although Mark has said he thought the film was ultimately bleak. Civil War was published in 2007 and was the US industry's biggest selling comic book of the decade. He was awarded the MBE, which is the member of the Order of the British Empire, in the 2013 Queen's Birthday Honours List for his services to literature and drama. According to IMDb, Empress, Wanted 2 and Untitled Kingsman Project TV series have been announced and the Magic Order TV series is currently in pre-production. So Meg, Buddy and us are very excited for Mark Miller. The fabulous Mark Miller, thank you so much for joining me on the web show. We met obviously during Life After Flash. That of course was one of the films that you grew up with. Were there any other films that you grew up with that have made such an impact in your life today? Yeah, I think I was so lucky that my mum got pregnant exactly when she did, you know, because it meant that I had such a brilliant run of movies in my childhood. Like if I'd been born five years earlier or later, it might have been different. It could be a, be a different person you're sitting talking to here. But I was so lucky that I was seven when Star Wars came out. I was eight when I saw Sinbad and I, the Tiger. You know, Superman came out when I was just about to turn nine. And uh, Flash Gordon when I was 10, you know, so it was just such a brilliant run. Just, just maybe when I was about to grow up and not be into this stuff and get into football or something like that then another great geek movie came along and just pulled me back in. And, and it was actually a great run. I mean, all the way from about 77 till about 85, you know, up to Ghostbusters, Back to the Future, Gremlins, all that stuff. I mean, it was such a fantastic childhood. I've read some articles about you that you, from a really early age, loved comics and got into comics. But do you remember ever wanting to do anything else? You know, like kids grow up wanting to be firemen or astronauts or presidents, or did you ever have any dreams, even ridiculous or fantastical when you were growing up of anything else? Or has it always been comic books for you? I was sort of nudged towards real life um, occasionally, you know, when I was at school. And because I was reasonably smart at school, I would, I would be encouraged towards more academic subjects, you know, so I was doing sciences and, you know, that my plan was to go and become a GP, you know, like a, a a position in a small town kind of thing and uh but but really i mean every time i was sitting when i should have been you know doing four sequels mass times acceleration i was drawing a picture of green lantern kind of on the side of the page so like uh, if, if everything i lived and breathed from i was like four or so you know it was comic books i remember getting my earliest comic books i can't quite remember which ones came first because i still have them you know but like uh 
but I remember just being mesmerized instantly and there was a Superman cartoon on TV and everything. So I was, I was in, there was no way I was going to do anything else. And, and what was really hard though, is I lived in a small town in Scotland, miles away from Hollywood, miles away from New York, where publishing happens. So I didn't know how it was going to happen. So I must have seemed like insane. Like, you know, these people you see on Pop Idol or something, you know, saying, oh yeah, I'm, I'm going to be Beyonce's partner, you know, for the, her next song, you know. It's like, I must have seemed like that because I would go into the careers officer at school and say, I want to write Batman or I want to write Superman. And I, I wanted to be an artist at the same time. So what was the, I guess, the opinions of other people in the, the town that you grew up in when you would say things, like when you made the decision that you wanted to be writing comics, was it kind of welcoming idea or was it that kind of small town of oh you know that's just kind of in your head that doesn't happen in this kind of town the combination like my mom i think was really worried about me <laughs> you know like my mom <laughs> she was kind of like uh, you really got to stop this <laughs> you know and i remember when i was about 12 or 13 or something you know um like showing her like a, an art portfolio and, I, and, and she was always super encouraging and so was my dad and my brothers and my sister um but i think by the time other kids were really starting to grow up and think about shaving and stuff like this. I think she was just a little bit worried. And I kept saying to her, oh yeah, I'm going to work in comic books. And, and she, I think she was scared I was going to be like, you know, penniless. I think that was her fear. It's like saying, I'm, I'm going to be a mime artist, you know? Um, and she would always gently encourage me towards something a bit more conventional. Um, but I just, I just had no interest in anything else. In my hometown, um, Everybody was kind of eccentric in their own way. Like, there's an awful lot of people at my old school went off into music careers and film careers and all this kind of thing, which is quite unusual for a small working class town in Scotland. But um, we had a really unusual headmaster. Our headmaster back in the 1960s had won the Brain of Britain. So he was like the smartest man in Britain kind of thing, you know, and he, uh, he also was a former well-known goalkeeper and a television commentator and everything. So, so we always had these kind of weirdly lofty ideas, you know, like uh, I think my class, there was about 30 or 31 of us when I started S1 in high school. And of that, almost everyone has done something quite interesting, which is odd, you know, way more than a private school. Like people have just ended up with the weirdest, really interesting jobs. At one point, there was two guys from my school playing for Scotland against Brazil in the 1998 World Cup. And I saw them on screen at the same time two guys in my school, you know. So it was, it was weird, you know. So our, our school, we always knew we were going to do something something fun. Not as much as Stan, Stan Lee's school is the most amazing one. There's DeWitt, DeWitt Clinton High School in, the, in New York, the most amazing school. Like Calvin Klein, Stan Lee, Bob Kane, who created uh, Batman. Uh, you had uh, Burt Lancaster. It's insane. You look up for that school and it's, it's got us beat. But these guys were all there at the same time back in the 1920s as well. So what was the moment that you made that transition from this is what I want to do to this is me actually doing it? It was actually poverty and, and quite often you talk to musicians and everything and having no money is sometimes the best catalyst you know for, for making what you really want to do happen because there's no alternatives. Now I dropped out of university when I was 19, I had no cash at all, no parents, like uh, living in a tiny squalid flat and uh, I thought I've got to make some money. And I didn't want to do a regular job, you know, because most writers are lazy. And I, I tried to a regular job. But then, unfortunately, it was at the time when there was just no jobs in the UK, especially in the North. And we, there was deindustrialization going on. So there was like 50 people applying for every one job. So there was just no chance. So what little money I had, my, my unemployment benefit uh, for those few weeks, I spent on stamps. And my sister used to steal me A4 paper out of her, her work. And I went to the local library and started typing submissions uh, to comic book companies. And I was really lucky, like really quickly. Um, the, the market was kind of exploding in comics and they just needed people and any idiot would do. And I was, I was that idiot. Did you, when you started out, have a goal of where you wanted to end up? Or did you really just kind of take it one step at a time with your career? Oh, absolute goal, yeah. My, my goal was to work at DC Comics. And, and it's funny because Sometimes it's, it's like a parable or something, you know, you go off on your, your huge destination and then you realize when you get there, this isn't really where I want to be and I then wanted to be somewhere else. But growing up, all I ever wanted to do was work at DC Comics and do Superman, Batman, Justice League, all that stuff. And then when I got there, it was really quite um, corporate. It was not what I expected. I, you know, there's a certain illusion, I guess, sold to readers that this is tremendous fun. And when you get there, it's like a a hardcore bullying environment, everything <laughs> really unpleasant, you know, so, so I was kind of like, I'm not into this at all, you know, so, so I, I stayed on the periphery of it and I uh, didn't really have much success, nobody really 
I read anything I did at the time. It was always just staying above cancellation. I did a little run on a Superman book for kids uh, that I really enjoyed, ran for 19 issues. But even that, every month I used to call the editor and say, are we canceled yet? Because I was always just floating at break even. And every month it looked like we could get cans and it would mean no cash. So I was terrified for like the whole 19 months. But then, uh, then I just lucked out and, and then my career took off when I stopped thinking about plans and destinations and everything. I, I just took each gig as uh, just something that looks fun and nice people to work with and everything. So I, I went off to Wildstorm and did a book called The Authority, which was a hot book. And that kind of started my career really. And, and there's a huge lesson in there, I think, to, to not have a plan and just do what you really want to be doing is the, is the secret of any creative endeavor. Was it a, a quite an easy decision for you then to go off on your own and start your own company? There was a period in between where what happened was I, uh, I had a hit book. My first hit came when I was 30. So I'd been doing this since I was 19. Then when I was 30, I had a hit book. Um, and that got me poached by Marvel. And I'd never really been that interested in Marvel. And it's weird because I ended up becoming like, you know, really sort of pivotal within that company for 10 years. I was there for a long time. Um, but I didn't grow up a Marvel fan. I liked Marvel, you know, I read the stuff when I was really little, but I was always, DC was always the kind of cooler company uh, through the 80s. But what I, um, what I, and Marvel wasn't really well distributed in Scotland either. So what I did was um, I ended up at Marvel almost by default. And then the first book I did was the number one, the number one book. And then the second book I did uh, was like the number one or number two book for the next five years, you know? So I was like, this is crazy, you know? And everything, I, even though I wasn't really massively into Marvel, I, I somehow seemed to be finding this audience. Now, I really enjoyed what I was doing and I was working with great people. Um, but then I had a big conversation with Stan Lee and Stan said to me, listen, you've, you've got to uh, strike out your own, do your own thing. He said, all these books you're doing at Marvel's going great. You know, they're, they're very cinematic. I feel as if these things could be movies. I feel you'd be good at creating your own characters. And he talked me into it. He said, go off and do your own thing. And I started Mellow World next day. Knowing Stan Lee, like you do, what is one thing that people may not know about him? How wise Stan is. I mean, that's the one thing, because you have to remember he was an amazing operator. You know, like Stan's career runs from the 1940s, really up until the day he died. I mean, Stan was active the whole time. And most people are lucky if they have a five or 10 year career, really, you know, in, in, in the pop medium. Um, because it's very fickle and people want to see something new and something a little bit fresh. And um, Stan, Stan was an amazing survivor. And, and the, the weird thing was, as most people start to slow down in the mid-40s, Stan began, he just kicked into high gear and just got even bigger. So, I mean, it's always massively inspirational to any middle-aged uh, creators, you know, it's, it's cool. And, and I just loved him growing up, you know. So, like, uh, I wasn't disappointed when I, when I finally got to speak to him. And he was just very sage because he'd seen it all before. And... If you think about it, you know, there's been a lot of us doing this job over the last three generations that comic books have been around, four generations almost. Um, but Stan is the one that almost everybody in the world knows. Like, there's Alan Moore and Frank Miller, um, but Stan is so far above them in terms of public consciousness that like people just know, know who Stan is. Stan would charge $150,000 just for appearing at a, a show and everything. You know, it's like he's like a mega star in comics. Um, and he was very, because he was a... He was in charge of the business side of things as well as the creative side of things. He had an amazing rounded look at the whole uh, industry. Um, so he was very smart. He said to me, if I had the opportunities you have, which is creating my own stuff and owning my own stuff, that's what I'd be doing now. I wouldn't be writing Marvel stuff. You know, he said, don't do what I did 50 years ago. He says, go and do, go and do your own thing now. And it was, it was really, really smart. So when your projects, you went off on your own and your projects started to become big screen adaptations, your very first one, how did that happen? Did you, were you seeking that? Were you sought after? What was that process? I did what Stan said. I went off and I bought a pad from W.A. Smith's and a pen. And I sat in a train station and I wrote Wanted. I wrote the plan while I was waiting on a, a train in Glasgow. And uh, I thought, this is pretty good. There's something here, you know. And I put it together and um, I, I'd written issue one and sent it off to, uh, to the publisher who was quite keen to do something. Because I did a lot of Marvel hit books, I was getting good offers from, from other publishers where I could own the material. Um, and I thought, we'll give this a try, see what happens. I'll keep doing the Ultimates and the X-Men and all that kind of stuff, Wolverine in, in the meantime. But then weirdly, before this book even came out, when it was just in the catalog, um, a company called Mark Platt Productions, who'd made Legally Blonde, right? The, the most unlikely action movie uh, producer. Uh, but this guy is very smart. He used to run Universal Studios. You know, he's, he's amazing. Um, his uh, second in command um, called me up. Um, and, and I thought it was a prank. I didn't believe it. He, he came through an agent that I was using uh, for that particular project. 
And um, and he called me up and he says, "Look, we'd like to make a movie of this." And I was like, "Seriously? But you haven't even, you know, isn't it out yet? You know, there's there's no buzz on this." And he said, "I saw it in previews, which is the comic book industry catalogue, where you can see what's coming up that retailers can can buy in a few months' time when they're on the shelves." And he said, "It just looks really interesting. I really like it." So so we did a deal, and and it was insane. And I was just thinking, one, Stan is so right. He's so clever. He's, this was the absolute right thing to do. And I was thinking, will this ever happen again? You know, it's like. And then I found out Angelina Jolie's going to be in it. McAvoy wasn't a big deal at the time, but has obviously since become enormous. You know, Morgan Freeman's going to be in it and everything, and it was going to be directed by a guy I'd never heard of, but he was the biggest director in the Southern Hemisphere. Like uh, it was, it was crazy. Like his. Nightwatch movie, I think, had made more money than Lord of the Rings in Russia uh, and various countries in the Southern Hemisphere, you know. Um, so he, um, you know, he was, he was such an amazing uh, producer to have on this. He, he, he took a comic book property nobody had ever heard of and spent $70 million on it and made $342 million back. And then it did gangbusters on DVD and Blu-ray as well. So it was crazy, you know. And that, that, what an introduction to Hollywood. I mean, one of my friends, David Goyer, the guy who wrote the Batman films and everything, he said to me on the set of Wanted, actually, he was shooting Batman around the same time, Dark Knight. And he said to me, you're supposed to do like five rubbish things first. You know, your, your IMDb page should be embarrassing for a little bit. And then you get lucky with Angelina Jolie and everything. So I was insanely lucky, you know, just coming in at the top like that. And that just opened every door. So any, any, any project I had coming out, everybody made an offer for. So I... I'd, I'd never done a pitch in my life. I've never sat in a meeting and said, hey, what do you think of this? Um, they, people are always hovering and saying, okay, what's your next thing you've got coming out? And then I finish it, send it over, and then there's a little bidding goes on between them. Oh, every person's dream. I mean, just so nobody hates me, you know, I did have a living tough years before it. You know, so, but, but, so, but what that does, I mean, I would say this to anyone who is having tough years, is it makes you really appreciate it when things do work out because I do remember what it was like for every three months my phone to be cut off and then I would get the money together to get it back on again and then three months later it would be cut off again you know so about four times a year my phone used to get cut off and everything you know so for the first 10 years of my career but you don't realize at the time that that is just part of the process you know like you you're not going to be an instant hit and I remember when I was 19 thinking well I should be writing Batman and X-Men of course but then you realize, no, you have to start at the bottom. Like every career, you have to start at the bottom. And if you rise too soon, you'll actually rot too soon as well. You know, you, you need to build your legs before you can have any kind of long, long career. So if there were people out there that wanted to do what you have done, what would your biggest piece of advice for them be? Do something that interests you. I mean, that was the thing it took me 10 years to learn. I used to always try and please other people. And it was the worst Thing you can possibly do as a creator because you never will you know that if you don't please yourself you'll please no one so the most important thing is like what would I actually spend three dollars 99 on if I'm going to read it you know what would make me turn the page like so never anticipate trends or anything like that just just think what am I interested in right now and there's a reasonable chance a large number of people will also be into it if you're into it too so I think that's that's the wisest after I've been in this game for 30 years that's the wisest piece of advice I'd give anyone if you could be any character that you've created, who would you be and why? Well, I already am, you know, because I was a lot of the characters that, that uh, I did create. Like Kick-Ass is so autobiographical, you know, that there's little bits in Kingsman and everything that, that's me. Um, but if I, I'd, I'd pick somebody who had a really easy life. Like, I wouldn't really like to be Kick-Ass, you know, in the comic books because he gets beaten up all the time and he's always covered in blood and everything, you know. So I think I'd want somebody who got off with like really attractive people and you know had a you know a, a nice lifestyle and things like that. You know, I think I'd go for some somebody who's never in fights. You know, but unfortunately that doesn't really make great drama, does it? You know, you you kind of you want your characters to be having a tough time. If I had to pick anyone, who would it be? Um, that's a really hard question. Right? I've not. Do you know, in all the years I've done this, I've never been asked who I'd actually want to be. You know. Well, that good because I was really worried trying to come up with questions for you because I thought the amount of times you've been interviewed and yeah. there are people out there that know your work inside out and I just thought there's quite a high bar to be thinking of questions. That's a good one. Like the most normal question you get asked is what superpower would you like to have, you know? And I always try and think up 10 brilliant stock responses for this and then I forget them, you know? But what character of my own? I mean, Batman would be cool, you know, uh, but I didn't create Batman, you know, but Batman, he's got a nice house, good car, you know, cool costume and everything, you know, that's, that's, that's a good one. All of my own? I'm not sure. I, I maybe need to create some killer characters. 
Well, I have I have an important question actually that I because I know that we're coming to an end of our time. My birthday is tenth of December, and I know that your birthday is very much more a Christmas birthday. Do you think it's a positive or a negative having a Christmas birthday? Hundred percent positive. Hundred percent positive. And I'll tell you why. Because when you're really little, you always think it's all about you. Like the. <laughs> Like my family used to pretend to me when I was a kid, and this is, you know, I'm the youngest of six, so I was overly indulged. But when I was really little, my family used to say to me, look at all these decorations they have up in the city for your birthday, you know? And then and I was like, that's amazing. And I, and I, 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 I totally associate my birthday with Jesus' birthday, you know? So, like, <laughs> so I think it gives you a certain level of confidence growing up. You think, this is really nice of the world to get in on my, my birthday, this is, this is really good, you know? And then by the time you, you, you realize they're pretending, then the damage is done, you're already a narcissist, you know? So, so, so that's good. And the other thing that works really well is that you also always get a present. Like, people assume if you've got a Christmas birthday that somebody will say, oh, listen, I'll just give you a Christmas present and that'll be your birthday too. Never happened in my whole life, it's never happened once. And people can never forget a Christmas birthday because it's, it's so unusual, you know? So everybody always kind of remembers your birthday and there's no excuses. I had the opposite. I was always the one, the person, and this is probably how shallow I was as a kid. Yeah. I was always the one that got, oh, this will, this is for your birthday and it'll just be for Christmas. And so I always associated it with, you know, that kind of the combination present. And I, you know, was a little kid that I liked, you know, I liked quantity rather than quality because <laughs> I liked unwrapping things. But I love the idea that you would walk around the streets and, think that all the decorations are for you. That's really sweet. Here's me as a baby in a crib with three wise men coming to bring me gifts. <laughs> but like, surely whenever they combined your present like that, did they double up? Like if they were going to spend a hundred Australian dollars, would they spend 200 Australian dollars? No, because I also had a sibling too. So then, I mean, I mean, you had more than one, but <laughs> in my family. I was lucky though, because all my siblings were so much older. I was one of those babies that pops out at the end, you know? Um, so all my siblings were like 14 years older than me, 16 years older. So they were in competition. Like my parents had kind of already moved on from getting them really good presents and were just buying them jumpers and shirts and things, you know? Whereas with me, I then suddenly had, it was almost like having loads of parents. Everybody was working and they would, they would all buy me really cool stuff. So even though we were poor, I always had quite good, good stuff, you know, it was good. I love it. Well, thank you so much. I know that you're gonna go and make dinner. Um, so I really appreciate you spending the time talking to me and it's so it's been a fabulous journey meeting you in all of this and uh, I'm just so impressed of everything that you have achieved and I think you're incredibly talented. So thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thank you. So thank you for staying to the end of the episode. That's very kind of you. You're in luck because you're just in time for the competition before we announce this week's competition. We have a winner from last week's competition. Who's won? Who's won? The, the competition was to win a link to In Search of Darkness. We interviewed director David Weiner last week. If you missed it, there's a card, brilliant interview, great documentary series. And the winner, well, the competition was, <laughs> it's really early. <laughs> She's, come on, stay with it. Come it's on, let's really have it. Early. Um, the competition was, what is the most underrated horror film in your opinion? And what was the winner? The winner was, let me write down. Drum roll, please. Karloff87 said Street Trash was released in 1987. It was about homeless people. It feels like this is a made up one. Homeless people get their hands on ancient booze. Drop out and join the ranks of the few. The filthy. <laughs> the trash. <laughs> I got my own place, a condominium. I've never even heard of it. Well, I think we need to put it on our watch list. <laughs> yeah, we'll have a little look at that one. Street Trash, so well done. If you email info at lifeaftermovies.com, I will get that link to you. Now, this week's competition. Oh, wow, we've got a great one. It is a copy of Life After Flash, which is signed by none other than Sam J. Jones, Flash Gordon himself. And who else is that? Me. Oh, and you! And no other than Lisa Downs. It's a DVD, which yes. is signed 
by both of these fabulous people, one sat next to me and one in America. Ash thinks it's ancient technology. Maybe homeless yeah. people can find an ancient DVD. If anybody's got anything that can play this format, then you're welcome to this prize. And Lisa tells me lots of people still use DVD. I haven't seen a DVD player since circa 2005, I don't think, but people still seem to love them. But the thing about this one that's so special is it is signed. So how do you get your hands on this beauty? I can hear you asking. <laughs> Again, but before we do the, the, answer, the question though, Mark Miller's in this. Oh yes. Mark Miller, we interviewed him for this DVD. Hence the connection. It's not just a random entry because I had one sitting on my desk. There was actually a connection to the- Some interview. thought goes into this stuff, people. It's not just made up on the spot, you know. So how do we win it? <laughs> that's a good question. That's the question? <laughs> for next week's show on how to win this beautiful, possibly sort of defunct piece of technology is... I don't have any signed Blu-rays. <laughs> can you come up with an original superhero name and what would their unique superpower be? We like funny ones. We do like funny ones because it's not going to be a random winner. It's going to be chosen by us. Yeah, so okay. make it funny, make it good. Mm -hmm. Comment down below. Also, tell us what else you like. Did you enjoy the interview with Mark? Who else do you want to speak to? Talk to us, people. We want to hear from you. Don't forget to subscribe, press the notification bell, and then you will be told every time we upload a new content. We okay. have to say that, apparently. It says it in all the YouTube guides. Tell people. We know people don't like to be told what to do, but... It'd be nice if you It'd subscribe. be nice if you subscribed, if you can. But if we're not you, telling you you have to. Just if you accidentally click it. If you accidentally click the little bell button as well, <laughs> that would be better. <laughs> and if, if you subscribe and then you maybe want to watch the episode. And go back and watch all the previous episodes, that would also be good. And also, <laughs> if you wanted to just like tell all of your friends about it, share oh. it across social media, that would also be cool, wouldn't it? Please tell your friends. <laughs> <laughs> Please, it's just, you know, otherwise it's just us in this green screen. <laughs> we, right. we need to get out of the house. <laughs> we do. Oh, thanks for watching everyone. And thanks if you actually watched to the end and you're not one of those people that watched the first apparently 18 seconds. <laughs> yeah, the first 18 second arseholes we call them. You can see the stats on YouTube. <laughs> 18 seconds? We literally That's dropped. your attention. Thanks. We literally dropped like 40% viewing after the first 18, 18. 18 seconds. 18 seconds. So sorry if we're not as exciting at the beginning. I'll tell you what we're going to focus on for next week is the most bloody exciting first 18 <laughs> seconds you've ever seen. I might dress up as something or do something incredible. So make sure you come back for that. It's going to be great. So thanks for watching. Please enter the competition. It's free. If you have a pet. If you've got an old DVD player somewhere next to your Betamax and your Super 8 and your 8-tracks, this could be played on it. Meg, everyone. And Buddy. Buddy, thanks for watching. See you next week.